What I'm going to try and do in this final presentation at the end of this fascinating uh, set of papers is come back to the original notion of One Health and see whether we can perhaps think about that and, and broaden it in some way. And um, my area of knowledge on this is related to the Ebola outbreak in Upper West Africa in 2014-15. Um, which is seen as a zoonotic uh, disease, um, but one which is a crossover from forest wild animals, primates, possibly bats. We still don't know really what the uh, pathway of transmission is because Ebola was first identified in uh, Zaire, now Democratic Republic of Congo, and it's never been known in, in Upper West Africa. So we still don't know how it arrived. <clears throat> and there's speculation in the, in the literature. And the problem with speculations in literature is everyone repeats that speculation in the introductory paragraph and moves on to what they've got evidence of. And we still don't really have any evidence of whether there's some kind of complex cycle of transmission through bats or is it something to do with the bushmeat trade or what it might be. Um, my own bet is actually, because it's a sexually transmitted disease, that humans are the most important agents of spreading it around. And I think what we will need eventually is a study of the epidemiology of the African diamond trade, um, which is funded by European speculators, or American speculators, rich country speculators, um, who are very interested in being able to use modern methods of communication to both fund the mining of diamonds and then bring them out of Africa eventually to Antwerp and to Israel and so on. Um, and there will be humans involved in that trade who don't appear. Um, I, I'm very interested in the epidemiology of the um, subterranean part of the supply chain, hence my question to you in your rather interesting response. Um, so I think there's something there that we don't have any evidence of, but we need to eventually find out about. But I'm not going to talk about that this afternoon because I'm going to go uh, to the other end of the process, as it were, and not worry about the international dimensions. We've ended up with a very interesting and somewhat worrying um, map in which we're invited to guess where the next country will be for African swine fever. Um, so I'm not going to do that. Um, Ebola isn't actually a, a disease of that kind because the, the, the infection pathways work in, in a rather different way. And we do know something about the local infection pathways, which in the Upper West African case are all human. So that takes away the bush meat argument, the, the monkey meat argument, the, the bats and so on and so forth. And where we need to get to is understanding the human dimensions of spread and to understand that at the local level and to understand it from the perspective of the people who are involved in those infection chains. And that was what was needed for Ebola control because we didn't have enough understanding, uh, the international responders didn't have enough understanding of the local factors but at the same time the, the people involved in those infection chains at the local level themselves didn't have a clear picture of what was happening because the disease was new. It was not, um, there, there'd been no cases recorded in Upper West Africa until late 2013. So that's what I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to talk about One Health in the context of what kind of epidemic models we can make use of if we want to communicate urgently with local communities about infection risks. And this sort of brings what I want to say rather close to the first paper in terms of talking to farmers in Scotland about what factors motivate them to think about trying to prevent the spread of disease. Um, and we'll find, I think, in, in my presentation, rather, rather a similar way to Orla's first presentation, that we have to deal with not just epidemiological factors as understood in scientific peer-reviewed journals, but we have to deal with human emotions. And it's very important that we've got some framework for handling the emotions that are raised by uh, disease threats. So um, I've summarized some of the, the, the facts there, that Ebola is a new disease, at least in 
Upper West Africa. So it, coping with it required learning. And I then make the point that epidemiologists and affected communities learn differently. Um, and that epidemiologists use documented science, whereas victims used experience. And I think that was a, a point that came out of Ola's presentation as well. It's what the farmer knows which clashes with what um, the scientific literature says. And so, um, and, and this was real-time work in that no one had done the necessary background research on Ebola and how to control. This was the world's first epidemic. There had been outbreaks in isolated districts of Zaire and other countries around Central Africa, but they'd always been contained, and they'd been contained because there was a large element of, of human isolation. These were very difficult places to get to. It was very difficult places for people to get out of, so the, diseases ten the disease tended to burn out locally. But in Upper West Africa, the disease first struck at the junction of three countries, Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, right close to the local main road networks that radiated through those three countries, and the disease very quickly reached the capital cities of all three countries. And we had, for the first time, urban epidemics of Ebola rather than isolated rural outbreaks. So intervening was a question of doing scientific research, social, scientists, social scientific research and disease um, control research, epidemiological research, um, really in real time and, and getting results back from the field which would help shape uh, the strategies because the initial strategies were not working and there were some very alarming rises through the early months of 2014 in the number of cases and people were panicking globally about the potential for cases to reach Europe and to, to reach uh, North America and so on. Um, and so something had to be done and one of the things that had to be done was we had to understand how affected communities were really responding to the disease. So this is joint real-time research, action research, and um, it, I, I'm, I'm the, the nominal presenter of this, but it's a, a, a collective um, product, and um, one of the key players in this was uh, Esther McCoo, who here, who's here with us in the room, um, who volunteered to go back at the height of the epidemic into villages that we'd worked in previously in Sierra Leone and take our team of trained field assistants, research assistants, and collect information on how this epidemic was playing out among these communities as they were actually coping with, with cases. And, and without that input from her and her team of uh, local researchers, we would, have, we would have had nothing. I would have simply been pontificating, speculating like everyone else. So it was the um, capacity that we had to actually get real-time information from the ground about a new and unfolding, uh, developing situation, um, which was, well, the story that I'm now about to tell. So let me start by saying, um, asking the question, how do people learn? Uh, we started in Scotland, so we'll go back to Scotland now, to the Edinburgh Enlightenment. And uh, I'll say a little bit about um, one of my favourite philosophers, David Hume, born in 1711, um, who said that our trust in causality results only from custom and habit. Uh, we see no cause, uh, only that events are recurrently conjoined. And, th and that's a warning to scientific hubris, that we think we may have a causal mechanism, we think we may have an explanation. But in fact, at the end of the day, all we've seen is the latest available data, which arranged on the page or on paper or in a graph, looks as if it's pointing to a certain kind of explanation. And it may not, may not actually be uh, pointing to the correct explanation. So what Hume warned was that reason can't be its own justification. And he says that in order to control reason, um, reason is and ought only to be the slave of the passions. And he was not anticipating a kind of Trumpian view of the world in which everything is driven by passions with no reasons at all. Uh, wh what he's talking about is that reason should be, it should take into account 
emotional drivers of human behavior. If you really want to understand the nature of the process, you have to understand the human passions that are evoked by that process. So passions drive action, and reason is the check and balance. We learn from our mistakes. Um, so the first thing we needed to learn in the Ebola response in Upper West Africa in 2014-15 was that uh, Ebola evoked different passions among different groups of people. Um, first, we have the epidemiologists and the international responders, without whom we would not have been able to deal with this epidemic, so no one is saying that their contribution was not appreciated or was irrelevant or anything like that. Um, but their motivation, to understand their motivation, you have to understand that they were driven by the desire to prevent epidemic spread and save lives and also publish some papers in some top journals. Um, affected communities, however, were driven by a different passion and that's where the, the clash occurred between the views of the epidemiologists and the views of the communities, at least in the first instance because communities are driven by a duty of care for the dying and the dead. Um, and these two distinct passions were regulated by two distinct and, contra con and contradictory rationales. The epi epidemiologists were modeling how to cut infection chains, and affected communities were concerned to support the sick and the dying. So we put that on paper and we look at it in, in a sort of formal expression. We have two theories. Uh, the epidemiological modeling was all about the reduction of the reproduction factor, the famous R number. Um, communities with their concern to support members and to maintain social order had a second theory that good health requires mutual support. So if you take out the mutual support, then you're going to cause the conditions to become poorer. Uh, and that's important because what the, epidemiolo what the epidemiologists wanted to do to cut the, the R number was to stop people interacting. They wanted to stop people moving together to support each other in order that the disease would die out. And that's, that's where the uh, conflict emerged. Because the epidemiological initial approach was to prevent funerals, to put it at its most blunt. Um, and they were unable to do that. Um, let me say a bit about that now. Let's, let me describe to you in one or two pictures what, what that actually meant. Uh, theory A requires the rapid extraction of suspected cases from the community, um, ambulances, trained teams uh, with protective uh, biosecurity um, clothing using... Uh, generous amounts of chlorine spray and so on and so forth, um, more or less seizing suspected cases of Ebola and taking them to Ebola treatment centers, which were rapidly constructed biosecure facilities, um, five or six of them for the country of Sierra Leone, so there'll be a similar number in Liberia, a similar number in um, Guinea, um, but a small number averagely about 100 and 150 kilometers away from where the cases were, were to be found. Um, an ambulance arrives in the middle of the night with a si siren screaming, terrifying everyone, and a person is taken because they have no more symptoms than the suspicion that they're a contact of someone who has been shown to have Ebola and they've now got a high fever. And statistically, their chances of having malaria were much, much higher than them having Ebola. And yet, those people will be taken whether they liked it or not, and their um, families would not be allowed to follow them because it would be unsafe to put them in the ambulance. They had no other means of, of traveling. So those people were whisked, whisked away to an Ebola treatment center built according to a manual designed and developed over several Ebola epidemic outbreaks in other parts of Africa by agencies like um, um, Médecins Sans Frontières and so on. And here's a picture of one of these centers. Um, properly screened to provide patient privacy. It, it makes sense in terms of healthcare provision, 
the rights of the patient and so on and so forth. It was exactly the wrong thing to do to make Ebola treatment centres um, acceptable to local communities. What they wanted was to be able to see inside what was going on because they were not satisfied that in fact every case was an Ebola case. Probably only about one in ten or one in a hundred of the people that were taken into these centres actually had Ebola. Or at least that was their perception. The actual figure is probably closer to one in three. And once you were inside, the other thing that people knew locally was that the Ebola epidemic had been hugely multiplied by nosocomial infection, which basically for those of I didn't know the word either, so um, I'm just handing on information I've been given. It means an infection that is spread by the process of medical care. So if you pick up an infection in hospital because someone has used dirty surgical implements and so on and so forth, that's a nosocomial infection. And a huge number of the early cases of Ebola in Sierra Leone were created in the Lhasa Fever Ward, which was the isolation ward of Kenema Hospital, um, where the Ebola cases had been taken and the nurses and doctors didn't segregate the Ebola cases, didn't have the resources to, they didn't have the protective gear. They were crying out for these resources, but the world community was very slow to supply them with the, the necessary biosecurity, bioprotective materials. And we had something like, I'm, I'm doing this from memory at the moment, but uh, it, probably about 300 or 400 cases that were somehow connected with that initial outbreak in, in Kenema Hospital. So one thing that local observers knew for sure was that if you get taken into hospital as a suspected case of Ebola, almost certainly you're going to come out with Ebola. That was their thinking about Ebola treatment centers. So then rumors started to spread, and they said, look, you know, there must be a reason why a team of American army doctors have turned up at the Lhasa Fever laboratory to re-examine the blood samples that were taken 20, 10 years ago to see whether there are any cases of Ebola. It's not because there's any Ebola, it's because you know, these people, they're, they're, they're taking body spare parts, it's all a trick, they're trying to harvest uh, kidneys and so on and take them to Europe, and this is why, you know, it's obvious, isn't it? Look. Look at the building. It's obvious they're doing organ harvesting in that building because you can't see inside. Um, so the, 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 the very biosafety measures that were imposed by the epidemiological approach to Ebola um, were counterproductive because they made it impossible for families who are an essential part of Ebola coping um, to actually follow the patients and to see what was happening to the patients and to shout encouragement and so on and so forth. Families very quickly understood that they couldn't touch the patients, they couldn't visit them in the way you would normally in a hospital, but sure, they wanted to talk to them. And they said, if we're not there and if the patient doesn't know we're there, then they will die. Because recovery from Ebola... Ebola is a strange disease in the sense that it sounds very frightening when you read all the epidemiological literature about the virus, but it's no more mysterious than, than cholera. Because it kills through organ failure caused by dehydration. And the problem is it's very difficult to hydrate a patient uh, without risk to the, the nurse or the, or the doctor. And it took a long time for the agencies to find safe ways of hydrating patients. So the death rates were very high. Up to 70, 80% of all patients taken into these Ebola treatment centers initially uh, never came out again. And it was only later when Ugandan doctors came to Sierra Leone to show the, um, the international and the local medical practitioners how they can attach drips safely, that the death rates dropped to something like 30 to 40 percent. And that changed the attitude to the epidemic. Uh, Ebola was much more survivable than people thought, and the human will to live was really essential. Whether, if it's 30 to 40 percent chance of dying, whether you survive or not becomes partly your own determination to survive this thing. If you can somehow get through the first six days, then you're going to be okay. Um, otherwise, it will kill you through dehydration. And so the patient-family contribution was seen by the families to be really essential. 
And they, even if they couldn't dress up in, in protective gear and go into the ward and be at the bedside of the patient, they wanted to be able to be close up to the boundary, um, standing right by the do not enter high risk area sign, looking into the ward and talking with their loved ones so that they could encourage them and give them the best possible chance of survival. So that was the emotional rationale of the local people. And, and no one could say that it was incorrect thinking. So the issue then became, how do we persuade local people to think like epidemiologists at the same time as we're trying to get the epidemiologists to think like local people so they can come up with a compromise on this issue? Because if you don't, thinking like an epidemiologist, you build Ebola treatment centers, families are excluded, um, and families don't know the outcomes, including the test results. Rumors of organ harvesting circulate, continue to circulate, and patients are then hidden by families and secret funerals are carried out, and the outcome is that the disease continues to spread. And this is the graveyard that was attached to the Kenema Ebola Treatment Center. Um, when I went there to take that photograph, I had to climb over the gate, because unfortunately, the gatekeeper who had to be found in the nearby village, um, had lost the key. So this is not a graveyard that is being visited regularly by families. It's a beautifully kept graveyard, as you can see. The, the, the plots are decently laid out. They're all properly identified. Uh, the place is, is weeded, but no one ever goes there. And it's because the distance is a, is a deterrent factor. When I looked along the... The, the rows of the, the, the nameplates and looked at the place where the, the patient who died had come from, they were all places 100, 150 kilometers distant. Um, in many cases, families didn't even know because there was no reporting system. There was no way of knowing who the family was in any case, no way of communicating back. Um, so that was... Um, thinking like an epidemiologist, resulting in a, a beautifully laid out graveyard that no one visits. Um, thinking like an afflicted community, well, first, the first thought of the afflicted community is that the patient may not have Ebola. Uh, the symptoms are the same as malaria and typhoid, so the local advice was let's wait. There's a three-day dry phase in which you can't simply distinguish Ebola without a blood test from malaria or typhoid. High fever is the only real indicator. Um, the second three days are what's called the wet phase of the disease, uh, vomiting, diarrhea, um, bleeding, and that's when the organ failure is likely to occur. But by the time you've got to the wet phase, it's too late to move a, a patient. It's, it's too unsafe to the people carrying the patient to move them. You're just going to spread more cases. It will then become a bit like African swine fever with all those butchers um, spreading the disease far and wide. So um, if the patient's Ebola negative but goes to an ETC, they may become infected. And the outcome of that local thinking is that still the disease continues to spread. So that was where we come to an impasse, the conflicted passions. Um, can we bring reason to the rescue? Yes, we can. But we have to recognize the passion driving the epidemic. Uh, the epidemiologists were right. Infection chains had to be broken. Communities were right. Families had to remain involved with patients. Um, so then, in about November 2014, the British government that was leading in Sierra Leone um, fed with some of the results of our real-time um, action research, uh, started to think differently about how to deal with the epidemic. And they said, okay, let's see whether we can scale down these Ebola treatment centers so that we've still got somewhere which is safe enough to receive a patient. Um, it's, it's going to have quick diagnostic fa facilities, so within 24 hours we'll know whether the patient has got Ebola or not. And then the symptoms of the Ebola negative patients can be dealt with. They, if it's malaria, they can have malaria treatment and so on and so forth. And the Ebola cases can then be taken on safely in an ambulance to one of these major um, Ebola treatment centers. In fact, some of them just hunkered down in the local centers and, and survived. And 
the initial fear of some of the international responders was that the the um, the local centres would become centres for infection, but in fact the research that's been d done subsequently shows that recovery rates were as good in the local centres, the local centres as in the ETCs, um, and they were much more highly acceptable to local communities. And this is a picture of one of these new style local eight to ten bed. The, the ETCs had something like 150, 200 beds, whereas the local ones... You, what's interesting about this picture is you can see here, it, it's right bang in the middle of a village, whereas the ETCs were out in the countryside, 10 miles from anywhere kind of thing. Um, and so there were patients in those centres who were being... Uh, first of all, they were being cared for by some of the people in the picture there who were natives of those communities. So they were of the people they were caring for. So when the families came to collect information, they were talking to a trusted relative who could give an honest assessment of how the patient was doing. Um, they would even take food that had been prepared at home, which was considered to be a major factor in encouraging the patient's will to live. Um, and you could, you could literally stand at the gates and shout into the, into the wards, and the patient could answer. You could have a conversation. Uh, and this, this made it much um, easier for families to accept that their own principles of wanting to care for the sick were not being compromised, or they, they, they'd made a, an effective compromise, shall we say, um, with the Ebola responders uh, who were trying to impose the biosecurity model. Um, okay, so let me now push on to the conclusion um, of the reconsideration of the concept of uh, zoonosis. Um, and one of the things that we've learned from the Ebola event uh, in Upper West Africa is that you need to have active skepticism about how epidemi epidemics um, are being driven. Um, in the Upper West African case, we had to break the link with the wilderness conservation debate. It wasn't bushmeat and hunters who were driving the epidemic. It took too long to establish the real message, which was avoid human contact, because this is actually being spread from case to case by, by humans and human body fluid. Um, and the message was a hard sell. Um, because you couldn't easily talk to communities and say, initially at least, this, this is spread by body fluids, therefore you have to cut down your contact with the patient. You can't wash the body if you want to prepare it for burial. In fact, you have to accept that the burial team will do that uh, using a biosafety protocol, but the compromise was we will allow you to attend the funeral. At first, people were kept away, and then WHO authorised a new description. There was the initial label for this was called safe burial, and they created safe burial teams, and bodies were literally removed forcibly and buried, some people would say dumped, uh, by the burial teams. And then from October, I think it was, 2014, they, they had a new designation, which was safe and respectful burial, and the respect was the key game changer as far as the local communities were concerned. Uh, they were brought into the burial process. The rituals were changed. It was at that point they allowed imams and pastors to be present at Ebola burials, and the family eventually were kept at a distance. There was a red and white tape quarantine and all the rest of it, but at, at least they were allowed to witness uh, the burial. Um, the thing we found it difficult, most difficult to get over was the idea of home care. Um, I corresponded with... Um, one agency at the height of the, the rising epidemic curve, I think it would have been September in 2014, and I said, we need a home care protocol. And they said, no, we don't. They said, uh, have you been asked for this by the government of Sierra Leone? Because in that, otherwise, we're not even going to look at this request. Uh, and I said, why not? And, and they said, because it would not be ethical to have a home care protocol. It would just encourage people to keep their patients at home. And I said, no, but if you look at it differently, the reason the patient is being kept at home is because there's no way of responding quickly enough. 
um, uh, at this particular point that I wrote, in the whole of Kenema district, in which there was something like several hundred cases at that time, there was just one ambulance. And it took, on average, three to four days to get to a village with an Ebola case. Some of the villages were not even on road, so the ambulance couldn't, couldn't even get there. Um, and then it took the burial team time to get there as well. If the patient had died, it was too late, but still the body had to be kept for days on end until people in, in the end said, we, we couldn't do this to our loved one. We just had to take the risk and go and, and, and bury that body because these people had not turned up after three or four days. And, of course, as you know, the, weather, the, the, the climate is simply not, not feasible to keep a dead body without any refrigeration in a typical African village for anything more than a few hours. So I said, if, if you think about the delay, you're going to have to give advice to people what they can do to remain safe, or as safe as possible, while they're waiting for the ambulance. And that, that was a compromise at the end. Finally, I think it was at the end of October or the beginning of November, we got the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to produce this poster that could be put on walls in villages. And it wasn't called a home care protocol. What it was called was what to do while waiting for the ambulance. And if the ambulance was never going to come, as in some villages that would be the case, then so be it. Just keep on doing what it says on the, on the poster. Um, <coughs> and it wasn't rocket science, as they say. Um, the protocol requires just one member of the family to be designated the carer, so not everybody comes and, and helps the patient feed and, and expresses sympathy. Uh, only one, patient, one person is going to do the, the really dangerous body contact, so then you've reduced your R number almost to... Uh, uh, overnight, if they can follow that uh, part of the protocol. Um, secondly, you make sure that the patient doesn't, if, if the patient has had, you encourage the patient to drink as much as possible, but they have their own cup and they fill their own cup. Uh, you don't do it for them because that is a, a risk point. And then um, when the ambulance turns up, you put the patient in the ambulance. But meanwhile, that message spread widely. And it was very helpful um, because it gave people the confidence now to deal with unexpected cases, many of which were not Ebola in any case, and um, they could reduce their risk from the actual cases that were Ebola. So this is the point that I want to come to, um, that there are wider lessons to be learnt from Ebola in Upper West Africa, and one of them is the need to broaden the concept of One Health. It's more than just the risk of cross-infection between animal and human hosts. It needs also to take account of other interactions between animal and human health, including economic and social interactions. And I think we've heard a lot about that this afternoon, and, and rightly so. So in a sense, I'm preaching to the converted, I know. Um, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I will... Um, oh, it's, can uh, it's fine. We don't need to stress. Sure? No? Yes. Okay. Um, Okay, there, there is a bit here, and I'm not sure how much uh, we need to go through it, um, because I've said some of it already. Um, but we needed a model to talk about infection that people could relate to, bearing in mind that Ebola was a new disease. And so was, you could talk about the hazard associated with body fluid in an Ebola epidemic. But if you've never seen Ebola, then you, know, you, you can't think through the consequences of that one. So one of my colleagues, Roland Suluku, um, in the animal health, um, in the animal production uh, department at Njala University, is an animal health specialist, and he's worked a lot on PPR. Um, so it's nice to make that connection as, as well. Um, and people have goats. In fact, I've got a picture. Next one. I'll go back to that, but I'll show you my goats. They're, they're cows. I spent two hours <laughs> looking, but, but you provided me with a picture of goats, so it's fine. You know what a goat looks like now, you know. But our cows are small, so I thought I'd slip that one as a kind of surrogate for goats, having spent two hours going through all my pictures and finding I've got none of goats. Um, but anyhow, um, PPR spreads... It's catastrophic because people have their life savings in goats. And if you ask them, you know, how, how, how do you make the decision to get a patient to hospital if they've got 
persistent malaria and it might be Ebola or whatever, they say, well, we'll wait for three days because we don't really have the money to, to move them. Uh, and then you've used up the dry phase of the disease. Um, but they said, if we're really convinced that the patient is sick, and now we've heard the messages about Ebola, yes, we would be very, you know, we, we, we would be willing to move them earlier. But to do that, we're going to have to sell a goat because that's the only way we'll get money. And we said, well, Roland, that's great then because you know what PPR is and they all know what PPR is. It's just like with um, the, 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 the African swine fever. Um, people can give accurate accounts of the symptoms. They can talk about the body fluids, the foaming. They can talk about the causes. It's when you bring a goat in that you don't know where it's come from. It's got no status, as we now say in Sierra Leone, because people will go around boasting about their status. I'm Ebola negative. I had a test, blah, blah, blah. So you didn't know the, te you didn't know the status of the goat. And people, um, and Roland used to go around preaching the message that if you put that goat in quarantine, build a pen for it and keep it in a, in a pen for 21 days, and if it's okay at the end of it, no, 28 days, I think it is for PPR, 21 days is the Ebola quarantine period. But you keep it for a, a given interval, and at the end of which, if it hasn't developed any symptoms, you can release it and it becomes part of the local herd. Otherwise, you'll lose all their goats. And they said, yeah, we know. And then they would give an example of how a year ago or two, five years ago, one infected goat was brought into the community and all the goats in the community died. Because PPR is a, is a new disease in Sierra Leone. It only came after the Civil War, um, spreading in from somewhere in Francophone, West Africa, where it's been known to be for the last 50, 60, 70 years. But it, it's sort of like Ebola in that it's known to be in Africa, but it's not known to be in Upper West Africa. So this was a good talking point. And in fact, sometimes when we went to talk to villagers, we didn't ask them, what about Ebola? We, we come in order to find out their attitudes to Ebola. Um, but we, we, wa we wanted to let them talk in their own terms. So we said, well, you know, any problems health-wise this year, last year? And then they would start to list what the really urgent problems were. And sometimes their first one would be PPR. If you've had a bad attack of PPR, they'd talk about PPR first before they would talk about Ebola. And then Esther or Roland or whoever was facilitating would take a moment to explain, well, that, that's a very good thing to be thinking about in an Ebola epidemic because PPR is a pretty good model for Ebola. Do what you do uh, with the goat. You know about quarantine. You know if you don't do quarantine, then all the goats will die. Well, it's the same thing with humans. And then we talked to them about what would you do? And Esther would throw in a question, well, what? did you do in the old days with smallpox? And people would say things like, well, we build a little baffa, little hut in the, in, the, in the farm camp because that's where the food is, that's where you harvest the rice, you can feed your patient easily, um, but they're isolated from the rest of the community. And so that became something we fed into this argument with the responders about a protocol, um, they, d they didn't actually put that part in, but we, we talked about it widely on um, internet discussion groups and the message spread around. And some people indeed even did that. Um, and I don't have a photograph with me now, but I've actually got a photograph of some of these little thatched tents that were being built in some of the villages to when strangers would turn up, uh, this was where they were invited to sleep until inquiries have been made about their status. Um, so the message uh, was spreading. And, um, well, I've said about... Uh, so what I'm suggesting then is that Ebola has brought us to a point where we can think of a kind of two-dimensional approach to uh, zoonotic diseases. Um, geneticists are familiar with a two-dimensional approach to plant and animal improvement, which they talk about genotype times environment. And uh, we've been part of a wider group in Varkeningen that have been pushing the importance of the social environment in terms of plant and animal selection um, and understanding that you need to configure that in uh, into your strategies for genetic improvement. And similarly, the One Health approach, we need to think in terms of a similar two-dimensional approach in which we've got the epidemiological drivers on the one hand and the societal drivers on the other hand, um, accepting Hume's point that all human agency is driven by passion, 
providing scope for the analysis of that passion, but more importantly, providing outlets for that passion to engage in a productive rather than a counterproductive way. Uh, and at the end of the day, passion should in turn be regulated by reason. And the reason comes from analysis, epidemiology, and experience, um, society. So I think I've got, um, uh, probably I'll skip that one. Um, let me just go to this last graphic, uh, which is in a sense my, my uh, conclusion. Um, one of the problems the epidemiologists had to overcome um, in the Ebola outbreak in countries like Sierra Leone was their um, commitment to the easy approach. Modeling is much easier if, it's, if you make assumptions about the linearity of, of spread. And all the early Ebola predictive models assumed, sort of using the kind of model you'd use for a flu epidemic, that if you had so many cases, there would be a kind of constant multiplier, and then you could go on and predict, and you ended up with a logistic curve. And at one stage, CDC announced that if the world didn't do something about Ebola in West Africa, there would be 1.5 million cases by the 1st of February 2015. By the 1st of February 2015, actually, there were 12,000 cases. Um, and the issue then became very challenging for the epidemiologists. They said, wow, maybe we've got our models wrong. And there was a group uh, led by a professor at Yale that came from various universities who said, well, what we've observed or what we've learned from reading about the Ebola epidemic is that the infection risk is very high for a very small group of people. The people that care enough about you not to abandon you when you're dying of Ebola. You know, this is about, you're talking about your mom, possibly your dad, or your wife, or your husband, but not many more people than that who will actually deal with you in extremis. I talked to one young man who'd buried his mother after he assumed correctly that she died of Ebola, and he said, well, I did report, I waited for three days, and he said, I could not bear to leave my mother's body in that state. So he said, I knew all the risks. He said, if I die, I die. He said, I will wash that woman's body, and I will bury her decently. And that, the, the people that will do that for you are very few. So now reconfigure your model so that it's not just a general risk of bumping, bumping into someone on, on a tram or a, a train um, or in the marketplace, but it's the the very few number of people in the world who care enough about you to do what that young man did. And once you've got that, then you can rewrite your mathematics and you will get a completely different predictive outcome. And this paper by this, this group led by the professor at Yale um, actually came up with a figure. They said, we think the maximum number of cases from Ebola will be something like 15 to 30,000, which is pretty well what it, it turned out to be across the, the three countries. So this graphic, sort of in and among that, if you're good at reading graphs, you can probably see that there's lots and lots of bumps along the road. Um, it doesn't show clearly enough because I've not separated out the figures, but the initial rise was to do with the cases in two chiefdoms in um, Kailan district. Um, and the local people, long before there was any official response to Ebola from the international community, they'd figured out how to deal with this disease. Because fortunately, their paramount chief was a trained um, laboratory technician, and he had a phone, and he had contacts with the few people in the country that knew enough about Ebola to give him correct advice. And then he mobilized local people. He mobilized the women, which was why I was about to show you a, side, a slide of the, the women's uh, society. Um, and he mobilized the the young men in particular, to go out and do the quarantining, do the case finding, do the protection, uh, and do the safe burial. Though they, they lacked the protective equipment, they improvised with plastic bags and what chlorine they had and so on. And uh, the Paramount Chief introduced me to one young man. He said, this man led our burial team. And he said, I've seen him. In some days, he said, they buried as many as five people from Ebola, and this young man took up their bodies in his hands from the cart they brought these bodies in, and he personally laid them in the grave. And thank God. Forgot Ebola.
So uh, you see some of these sharp rises and falls in these different districts. As the epidemic came, it went. It moves on to another district. It, co it comes and it goes. Um, another entire area is incorporated here. Um, and slowly, uh, the, the red question mark is where the Ebola treatment center was introduced but it doesn't really actually make much difference to these little local surges, these little local epidemics that are conquered um, locally uh, by a mixture of international response, local mobilization, family caring, um, and perhaps some degree of epidemic burnout. Because if you've got people who are exposing themselves to that amount of Ebola risk, as this young man was, burying these bodies barehanded, um, the chances are that he's developed some natural immunity, which is something we don't know very much about in, in humans, but I'm, I'm sure that it's there, and later research will show that this is one of the reasons why some of these local responses were so effective. So um, I'm suggesting that we should think differently. Um, we shouldn't see this as a battle between two different systems of understanding, um, between science on the one hand and local community response. And I think that message should underpin the whole of the One Health response because people think strategically about their, their animals, but they also think emotionally about their animals. And certainly they think emotionally about their family members, and this should be figured in to the way that we think about building our modeling responses. And out of that, we should then aim for what several of you have been pointing towards this afternoon, which is a kind of more unified um, approach in which reason and the passions are united in an effective approach instead of being seen as somehow competitive. Thank you. Do we have um, a couple of questions for Paul before we reorganize ourselves to into the panel? Yes? Uh, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, as always, very inspiring. I, I, I think there is one issue I would like to bring up in relation to your this conclusion, and it, it relates to uh, the role played by the team of Esther, and that is we as scientists, we are so much influenced also by all these media images and all this fear that it instills in us on what is going on. I, I'm doing research on security in West Africa and you have this massive information about it's not allowed to go to that place, it's not allowed to go to this place. And then when you do that, you can also deconstruct the whole images. But I, I think there is an element of Mm -hmm. Some risk taking, but also take seriously to listen and discuss with the people, at, at even in very tough. So, so it's just a comment. Well, I, I'll, I'm going to turn your question to Esther because she was asked that question in Oklahoma um, last November, and someone said, "Weren't you afraid?" Do you want to respond? Oh. Actually, we should use the mic for the. I can't, I can't remember what answer I gave. But I, uh, no, you said no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, well, in a in, in situation like that, I was not afraid, to be honest. You cannot go to that place because I know Chris Whitty and others, and you anthropologists, you uh, Chris Whitty was the head of the chief medical advisor to the British government. So I was on the panel because I was really fighting because all the rumors they were telling me in the, not rumors, I was on the panel discussions and so forth. I was really fed up. I said, just like the young man who said, I cannot be a, leave my mother or my to die in that situation. So I just said, oh, let me go to this community. Let me see what is happening. Because I know that my community people, will, uh, will not, they know what they are doing. But something is there. Probably they've not had a good communication. I was not afraid. I went there. I even went into the community. I sat down with the person who had Ebola. I ate with her. She cooked yam, and she gave me the yam, and I ate 
even the community people we are surprised. I was not afraid. You being in a situation, you, you don't care. Because I was trying to help my people. I want them to understand what is really going on. Let them feed me. They, they, they educated me in a situation like that. They were telling me things. I went there unknown, but they knew what was happening. So they told me, we discussed things, and they said, this is what I told so them. Well, you know, but probably they didn't tell you that what you are doing is a good thing. But they said, well, they, nobody came and told us this. So I was not really afraid. So at times in the situation, you go there, don't put your idea. Let them tell you, make as if you don't know. I went there as if I don't know. So they told me something. Then I put two, three together and made my conclusion. Let me just add, if I can, to that, that um, one of the reasons I used the distinction that Hume makes between reason and passion and then talking about how we need to unite reason and passion is that unification actually has to be done through the personnel that are involved and that came out several times in the presentations uh, this afternoon that you're very reliant on key people in Uganda to facilitate. Some of them are shall we say, brokers, like the, the Ugandan veterinary officer. Um, but others are key community interlocutors, the people that will motivate uh, a focus group to be serious about the discussions and so on and so forth. And, and you're also looking to win over champions in the community, like the, the, the Scottish farmers, where you can see that some of them really want to kind of just close off from that debate, but others are willing, because they love their country or whatever it might be, to, to try and get a, a, a epidemiologically clean Scotland and so forth. Um, so I think that if, if I was to make a criticism of this afternoon, I would say we got to that point several times, but we didn't discuss it enough, because it's got all sorts of implications for who's on the scientific paper, um, how people are paid, um, how you recruit and train those people, because the, the, the best of them are not people that come to you with PhDs already who've spent half a lifetime in the city. The people that have been living in those villages who know and care passionately about what goes on in those communities and want to try and make life better, but they don't have the paper recognition that you need as scientists to work in a formal collaboration. That's got to be talked about, and it's got to be Solved. I think it's the biggest lesson I've learned from Ebola, that all the people that did the really important work are still today co totally unrecognized. You know, it's like in every battle, the people who were never there got all the medals and the people who are actually on the ground died and so no one talks to, talks to them or about them. But there's a, a huge number of unrecognized e Ebola responders from the Upper West African epidemic who need to be identified and they need to be recognized and they need to be woven into all the international discussions about research on pandemic preparedness and so on and so forth. That's, that's my, that's my uh, I think that, that, that's my kind of final most important point. Thank you very much. <laughs>